everybody. So what have we just learned that good morning at home? What have we just learned this morning? Having an amazing countdown is great when the kids all file past us and go out the door. When they're all confused, it doesn't work. Um, so uh, welcome everybody, welcome to Hope House Church. Glad that you're able to be with us. If you're a visitor this morning online or in person, it's great to be here. Isn't it amazing how rain changes everything? Last week you couldn't move in here. Now everybody's obviously watching online. Um, so if it snows, that's it. There'll be, there'll be me and the band here. Um, <laughs> no, it'll be me. <laughs> I'll be walking in. Um, there's been a lot of mountain talk this week. Have you noticed in the worship and everything? I loved all of that. Um, I, I, I kind of wanted to sing Climb Every Mountain. I wanted to do the whole Julie Andrews thing and, and run across the moorside singing Climb Every Mountain. And I, has anybody here ever climbed a mountain? I mean, I don't mean like Everest. I mean, you know, like Snowden or someone, or Ben Nevis. Hands up if you've done it. Hands up at home. Put a little, put a little thumbs up at home if you've done that. Oh, a cable car doesn't count. <laughs> That's like me saying, oh, I've been up Mont Blanc, I climbed Mont Blanc on a cable car. <laughs> Penny Ghent counts. I, d- I, did, I did the, um, we did um, the ones, in the, the two, the tallest ones in England, uh, with the, the next, the tallest two, I did side by side, then we went to Lake District. This, we had this insane thing, I'm, some of you know this story, but we had this insane thing where um, we had three days and a tent. Uh, I was on an outward bound course, and we had to walk as many mountains as possible, as many peaks as possible in those three days, starting at the centre and returning to the centre. And so the idea was you're walking, you get to the ridge, and you just follow the ridges. Except we weren't very good navigators. So the winning team did something like, I don't know, 50 peaks, in, in, then came back after two days, figuring the, the other had won it. And we did like 19, except we did 19 like that. They did 50 odd like that. And then we realized we could have done that. <laughs> we could have done the same. We thought the idea was you went up one and down one, and then you went up the next one and down one. I cannot tell you, I've never been more tired in my entire life. And just when you think you're at the top of a mountain, there's always a bit more. Has anybody ever had that experience where you know you're at the top and you reach the bit you've seen and then you look up and there's a bit more? It's like God adds bits. It's just like he winds you up. Like, we're at the top. No, God's added a bit. We're at the top. He's added a bit more. In the past two weeks, we've, I've been talking. Um, it's actually worked really well. I've done three in a row. And of course, this week, I, um, uh, I'm stepping a little bit as well for someone. In the past two weeks, we've had uh, stories about walking on water, and it's all revolved around Peter to some extent, understanding that um, even though Jesus may send us through a dark place or lead us into a dark place, he's always there to catch us. There's a purpose and a reason for that. And the second thing we've seen is seen that when Peter had a revelation of Jesus, he experienced the transformation of his life. And when we have a revelation of Jesus, there can be a transformation of our lives. In both these situations, our focus has been on seeing who Jesus really is. And the last part of this three-part series is is helping us to see who Jesus really is. So we've talked about the history. Remember last week we had the history lesson about Caesarea uh, and Jesus being proclaimed king where the emperor, the Roman emperor, was proclaimed king. And this is a big thing. It's a a radical thing that happened. Um, The Roman emperor was king and a self-named son of a god. And Jesus was the king, the son of the living God. So there were comparisons made there between human announcement and God's anointing. And this, uh, this week, I want to take us up another mountain, uh, Mount of Transfiguration. So I just want to ask the question, who has ever seen a Jedi glow? Really? And you call yourself a church? Who has ever seen a Jedi knight glow? You've seen the Star Wars films, haven't you? The films? And the Jedi warriors, what do Jedi warriors do? They glow. They have that glowy thing. Obi-Wan Kenobi glows in the dark at the end. Of, you, you Philistines. <laughs> Call yourself Christians. <sighs> You've got to watch Star Wars. Oh, when they die, they glow in the dark. Yeah, you see who they really are. You get to see who Jedi really are because they glow in the dark. Oh, I love that. I thought I I made a major point there, and it's fallen flat. (laughs) She wanted to say the Bible had Jesus glowing first. He's been there. 
Transformations matter. How we see things, how we see how things really are matters. I mentioned earlier the COP26 meeting this week. Who was excited about the COP26 meeting? Oh, what is wrong with you today? I'm excited because in a week's time we're going to resolve all the world's problems. Come on. The polar bears are waiting in eager anticipation. Oh, you let me down. If you notice at COP26, he's telling us about all the things that are going to change and go wrong. Pandemic, is, TV is full of people telling us all the things that are going to change and go wrong. Oh my days, it's hard work. All of our lives have changed. And then I've been looking at kids returning and seeing those kids have grown up and everything has changed. Have you noticed all of our children we've not seen for so long, now we're gathering as church again. They all look different. They're all changing, experiencing different things. Some challenging, some exciting. Life is transforming around us. Nothing is the same. You know, if nothing is the same, we need to live accordingly. We need to live for God. I, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed when I look at the news at the moment. I've got Greta Thunberg that complains and talks. David Attenborough that talks and challenges. Politicians that talk. And I don't feel fearful when I look at those things. I feel hope. I feel hope. Because our hope is set in the Lord. You know, all of these things matter, but our hope is set on Jesus. We bring the future, the eternal, into our right now situation. Romans 8 says, This I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits, the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. You know, who we are matters in this world. How we treat this world matters. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. When we see the glory of God, we begin to understand that the world should be full of his glory. The world is full of his glory, but it needs to be revealed. Our good news goes beyond the cross. To the revelation of Jesus, the King over all the earth. That's why when we worship this morning, we're not just singing songs. We're not just singing nice songs or songs that entertain us. We are bringing our worship. We are giving him our all, physically, emotionally, spiritually. You know, if you're just singing a song, just, just challenge yourself. To get before God and say, Lord, I don't want to just sing songs. I want to bring my worship. I want to proclaim these truths. The good news is the revelation of Jesus as the king and his kingdom come on earth. The best part of that is the salvation it brings to our lives. But don't ever lose sight of the truth that Jesus, the king, is the center of our story. You know, we're not the center of the story. Jesus is the center of the story. It says in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be revealed to you. Seek him, and we begin to see differently. So, let's have a look in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 to 9, at one of the strangest stories in the Bible that I usually try to avoid speaking on, because it's kind of strange. Matthew 17, 1 to 9. Uh, turn to it in your, in your phones or in your real life Bibles or whatever you want to. And I'm going to read this. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I can put up three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you've just seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. So it's a powerful story, isn't it? Hands up if you think it's the weird story in the Bible. Well, some of you are with me. I read, every time I read that story, I read it as a kid in Sunday school. Read it, we did it at school and did my O-level RE. And I read it now and I think, what is going on? 
What is God? I, I, can't, I, I want Jesus. I want Christianity. I want my faith. I just want it to be sensible. I don't want people to appear and to glow and to shine. I want it manageable so I can hold it, so I can restrict it. All of this story takes place a week after Peter realized Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And he proclaimed him the true king in the heart of the temporary kingdom of Rome. We have that little history lesson. Right after that, between that story and the story I've just read, Jesus explains about the crucifixion. The disciples begin to understand that Jesus' mission is different to the one they imagined. And they were confused and they needed to see who Jesus really was so they could place their faith perfectly in him. The transfiguration is a scene that many preachers get wrong. So today I'm going to preach three sermons. Well, somebody could have cheered. <laughs> transfiguration sermon, I'm going, to read the, I'm going to read the first two sermons really quickly, just so you're familiar with them. Okay, sermon number one. Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. If you've ever sat through more than a handful of sermons or endured one of mine, then chances are you already know how the preaching from this point goes. Sermon one. I'm supposed to point the finger at Peter and mention this episode is yet another example of Peter getting Jesus wrong. I'm expected to rebuke Peter for wanting to preserve the spiritual mountaintop experience. From there, preaching on the transfiguration is permitted to go in one of two ways. I'm allowed to pivot from Peter's foolish gesture to the supposedly sophisticated observation that discipleship isn't about adoring uh, glory mountaintop experiences. No, it's about going back down the mountain into the grit and the grind of everyday life where we can feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and feel good about being Christians. Amen. Amen. Sermon one. Have you all heard that sermon? Yep. Sermon number two is shorter. Rather than pivot to the poor, I can keep the sermon focused on Peter. I can encourage you to identify with Peter, the disciple whose mouth is bigger than his brain, and whose passion is never on point. I could preach Peter to you and comfort you that Peter's just like you, a weak, imperfect follower who fails at his faith as often as he gets it right, and yet Jesus loves him and you, and builds his church on him. That's how you preach this text. Go back down the mountain, back into real life, or look at Peter, he's just like you. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Coffee, anybody? Two sermons. And now the proper sermon. Oh, I'm edgy today. You see, I want to be the Christian. I want to be part of the church that goes up the mountain with Jesus to see his glory. I don't want to tell the story afterwards or hear it second hand. I want to be there. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. You see, what's happening here is some of the disciples never went up the mountain. Some of the, some of the disciples get to hear this second hand. I want to be that disciple that gets taken up the mountain. Yeah. I want to be the disciple that is so focused on Jesus. If he goes up a mountain, I go with him so that I get to see who he really is. So number one, know why you follow I follow because I want to see who Jesus really is. Jesus takes aside three followers who had focus, three people who lived on passion. You know, these three guys, if you read about them in Scripture, they just they may get it wrong a lot, they may get it right a lot, but what they are, they are passionate for Jesus, and they are learning. And I love that he lets them learn, and he rebukes them one minute, and he stirs them up and excites them the next. He challenges them one minute, and he fills them with all the next. They lived it out loud with a focus on Jesus. So many things want our attention. You notice that in our world? So many things want our attention, our time, and our passion, our distraction. There are so many good things we can do. There's only one God we can be with. Where do we go? Who do we follow? You know, we might gather people around us that interest us, that excite us. But do those people help us to follow Jesus? We want to be the people who gather friends around us that help us see Jesus for who he really is. So many people lose sight of Jesus, not because they don't love him, but because they surround themselves with people that are not committed to him. They're not passionate about him. I want to be surrounded by people that sharpen me, that challenge me, that excite me. So when Jesus says, come on, let's go, I am ready to go up the mountain. You know, church, God will have a mountain for us. God will have a call on us and he'll say, come and follow me. And if you're in a great place, if you're surrounded by the disciples and the people that encourage you and stir you up, if your focus is on him, when Jesus says, let's go up this mountain, you will be able to go up the mountain. Let's not be the ones that wait to find out what happened. The decision to grow 
in Christ always involves a choice between risk and comfort. Who wants comfort? Who thought about staying in bed this morning when they looked out the window? Who thought we can do this online? I wonder if I can set up a camera in my kitchen. <laughs> this means that to be a follower of Jesus, you must put aside the comfort priority for the growth priority in your life. Seriously, guys, we've got a short time, a short time in eternity to be uncomfortable so that for eternity we can grow. Two things with Jesus. You get to go to high places when you're looking at Jesus. You don't always get to go there with everyone. You can have comfort or growth, but you can't have both. Often we want Jesus, in, and there are people, there are people that have been part of us that have opted for comfort rather than growth. They've decided to stay at the bottom. They still know Jesus. They still love Jesus. We still love them, but they have opted to stay at the bottom of the mountain and never to see the true glory of Jesus. They've opted for the comfort. I want to opt for growth. Often we want Jesus to be in our valley bottom experience, our dark place. But you know, what did I say last week? Jesus doesn't leave us in a dark place. He leads us through the dark place. He leads us through the valley and takes us, takes us out. He has purpose for us. When faith overcomes fear, we get to go high. Psalm 121, 1 to 4 has already been, I lift up my eyes to mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, who watches over you will never slumber nor sleep. He's passionate about you all the time. He's passionate about us all the time. But he's passionate that we see him for who he really is. You know, that's the whole point of Jesus. He's here to help us see him for who he really is. Is what happens in our lives. We gather in two groups. Those who focus on the problems, those who focus on the solution. The problems that we have are very real. The solution is Jesus. And I'm, I, don't, I don't make any apology for that. People say, oh yeah, but I need something more practical. Yeah, you do need something more practical. But actually, the most eternal practical, it begins with Jesus. It has to begin with Jesus. Whatever we face, it has to begin with looking at Jesus. Because otherwise we're living in the temporary. Yeah, I don't want to focus on the problem. In my problems, I want to focus on Jesus. We may know about Jesus, but we need to see Jesus for who he is. You know, I know lots of people, but I don't always see them for who they are. Have you ever discovered, you think you know somebody, and then you get into conversation, and you discover so much more about them. You think, you think you know someone, and then you get into conversation. I discover they've got this whole rich background and all these things that they do, and they're capable of all these places they've been. And suddenly you see that person completely differently. Anybody have that experience? So rich when that happens. I've got to tell you, if you think you know Jesus, there is so much more to see. Because for eternity, the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. There will be no end to the new knowledge of Jesus, that we no end to our growing in him, no end to our growing understanding of him, no end to the revelation of who Jesus actually is. And if you don't know who he is this morning, I've got to tell you, you need to see who Jesus is. He's not some storybook character. He's not the Hollywood character. He's the King of Kings. So group one, group one people, you know, the people that problem, that they're kind of good Christian people. This is what happens. Philippians chapter two, verse five to eight. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's true, isn't it? How are they amazing verses? Come on, get hold of that. He humbled himself to become a servant, even to death on a cross. You know what? The first group of people... It's all about me. Because that part of the gospel is all about what Jesus did for me. And we like to leave it there. What did Jesus do for me? He humbled himself even to death on the cross. And it's remarkable, isn't it? But so often we let our faith end there. We let our faith end there. Because I want to be part of group two that continue to read Philippians chapter two. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father because at that point I'm around a group of people that say it's all about him yeah. it's all about him yeah. 
So often. Hey, I'm going I'm to dare to say this because I know enough people, enough Christians from enough nations to understand this. A lot of Western Christians think it's all about me. Yeah. It's all about me. It's all about Jesus, King of Kings. Come on, we need to get hold of this stuff because it changes everything. If Jesus is our King, it cha- if He's our Savior, we have our eternity. But if He's our King, it changes how we live. Yes. Come on, let's let's be honest. Yeah. I'm not a royalist. I'm worried about the Queen. Anybody else worried about the Queen? And you know I'm a Republican. All good Christians are, because um, I only have one King. Um, I'm worried about her. Because what a difference if our queen isn't there. If she's not queen. If we're just in like an ordinary country without, without a monarchy. Suddenly I'm thinking, well, actually, it's quite good having a monarchy. It's quite good having the queen. And the alternative's scary. The next one. And then I start to think, wow, if I feel like that about a human, an ordinary old lady who wears a crown, how should I feel about Jesus, the King of Kings? Yeah. Yeah. How passionate should I be about him? Yeah. How committed to him? Yeah. How much should his, his, his kingship, his reign, impact and influence my life? I want to see Jesus, the servant king. You know those people that call you um, hun on Facebook? You ever, anybody got that person? You have a problem? You put something on Facebook and say, hey, message me, hun. Ever done it? Have you ever called somebody hun on Facebook? Confess now. Repentance is good for the soul. I know you have, Mike. You don't look around. <laughs> Confession is good for the soul. You know, sometimes what we do on so- things like social media, we affirm people in their pain. We want to acknowledge the pain. We want to acknowledge the struggle. We want to acknowledge the hurt. We act- when we should acknowledge that, we should be passionate for people. We should care and we should comfort. But here's the deal. We should also point to Jesus. Because if we don't, we can keep people in the moment of pain. We can keep people in the hurt. We can p- keep people in the illness. We can keep people in the despair. And actually, we want to point to Jesus. Because he takes us through the valley bottom. And he takes us to the high point where we get to see Jesus for who he really is. And in our darkest moments, we need to know that a moment in time will come when we see again Jesus for who he really is. And so if you've grieved, if you've, been, if you've lost somebody, if you're hurting, if you're sick... Uh, if you're facing the loss of jobs and finance and you are fearful or if your children have broken away from you or if, you know, th- there are countless things here's the truth Jesus can take you to the dark place back to the high place where we can see him as king again he has not finished yet gather those people around you that point to Jesus and not just your problem you remember in the Old Testament Job Job's comforters Job who lost everything before God, he lost everything. And his friends came around, and they, and they were so lovely because they said, just curse God, it'll be fine then. You'll feel better. If you get really angry, you'll feel better. Just get really wound up and angry about this, you'll feel so much better. But Job was saying, no, I still see God. Yeah. And because he still saw God, the Lord took him through the dark place, back into a high place, and restored him. Yeah. Let's be the people that keep a focus on the Lord. Social media surrounds us with people that agree with us and that reduce our vision and our view and keep us low-level living. Don't surround yourself with people that will show you what people see. Be surrounded by people who show you what Jesus sees. Yeah. That takes you to high-level living. Find the Peter and the James and the John that follow Jesus and get around their passion. Those that know of Jesus stay low. Those that know Jesus get to go high. Don't get me wrong, you get around Jesus' people, they get it wrong a lot. Boy, they are bonkers. They're passionate, so they mess up. But they're passionate and they get it right. But they keep coming back. So the second thing, you need to know who to follow. Know who to follow. There he was, transfigured before them, Scripture says. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I love Peter. Yeah, let's build a tent. He'd have, been, he'd have been booking into a wake in next year, wouldn't he, already? He'd have been at one, year every, uh, one event every year, and he'd have been booked in already for a wake in next year. If you're new to us, a wake in's our big kind of weekend away as church with lots of other churches where we go camping and love God and pray for some. 
Moses in this story represents the words of the law. Moses represents the words of the law. Elijah represents the words of prophecy. Jesus is the word of God. And they're brought together in perfect unity in this point. Jesus pulls them together. It brings the future, the prophetic, into place. And it brings the words of law and gives them context. And it gives us freedom. It all centers on the word of God. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Don't, don't think this is just a weird story for no reason. This is a powerful prophetic moment. Where the word and prophecy are brought together. The past and the future brought together in Christ. It's so important that we see that Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. He is still the king. He was the king. He is the king. He will be the king. He's most importantly though, Emmanuel. God with us. Peter for a moment sees Jesus the king in all his glory. For a moment he looks up and sees Jesus for all he truly is. Not just the wise leader, not just the master, not just the, the, the pastor if you like. He sees him. In his glory. Let me read to you this sermon declaration. Anybody heard of Pastor Lockridge, DM Lockridge? You'll know the reading when I read it. I was going to play it to you, but I'm not. I'm just going to read it. I'm not going to read it how he reads it. For one thing, I've not got an American accent, uh, and, and I'd, I'm, I'm, I'm just sensible. Um, He's just got passion, I can't even begin to imagine. I want it. I'm just going to read to you what he says. I might get excited by the time I've done reading, but listen, because every word of this is biblical and is beautiful. Pastor D.M. Lockridge, mid-sermon, went into wild flow, and you've heard it on YouTube, and we've used it before. But he says this, the Bible says Jesus is purely powerful. He's impartially merciful. That's my king. Do you know him? That's my king. He's the king of Israel. That's my king. He's the king of, of righteousness. That's my king. He's the Lord of lords. He's endurably strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's morally graceful. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece for civilization. Jesus, that's our king. Do you know him? That's my king. He's the king of Israel. That's my king. He's the king of heaven. He's the Lord of lords. He's the only one qualified to be the all-sufficient savior. He's Jesus. He, he supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the culprit. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. Do you know that? He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. Jesus, that's our king. He's the king of glory. That's our king. He's the king of kings. That's our king. And he's the Lord of lords. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off of your hands. You can't leave it. You can't leave him. You can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. I couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't have him. And the brave couldn't hold him. That's my king. Jesus is my king. And his face shone like the sun. That's King Jesus. Church, we have to know Jesus is king. Yeah, yeah he's our saviour. But he's the king. You know, the only time I caused offence when I was at work was when I put a sticker on the back of my car saying Jesus is Lord. I put Jesus, he saves. I love Jesus. Hope house. Put all sorts of stickers on the back of my car over the years. I was a bit scary as an enthusiastic young teenager. <laughs> but one day I put Jesus is Lord. And then the abuse came. Because it was all right. Jesus can be anything you want. So long as you don't proclaim him Lord. Yeah. The minute you say he's Lord. The minute you say he's King. People are challenged. But here's the truth church. Jesus is King. And yeah. I want to ask you the question. Is he your saviour this morning? Yeah. But is Jesus your King? Yeah. Oh because that changes everything if Jesus is your King. You know, one of the problems is we half sell the gospel to people. One of the problems is we half live the gospel. We're happy to accept Jesus as our saviour and be part of the community. But when he's our king, it calls us to a whole new level. It calls us to a new place. It calls us to a new commitment. It calls us to bow the knee, to bend the knee, to profess he's Lord in a whole different way. I've never seen a film or a picture that captures Jesus as he really is. Who's seen the film Jesus of Nazareth? 
I've got to tell you, Jesus did not walk around with a semi-vacant look on his face, <laughs> like, like some sheet-clad Yoda. It, it, like, and he didn't have blue eyes. In fact, quite, almost certainly didn't. I want to... In the last battle, it's a book by C.S. Lewis. These beautiful words are written at the very end of the book where they're climbing a mountain into Aslan's land, into the land of the Lord. I'm starting to get upset. <laughs> because he's our king. Yeah. Church, I'm desperate for you to get the passion of this this morning. Yeah. I'm yeah. desperate for you to have the passion of this. I don't care if you attend church. I don't care if you attend a connect group. I don't care how many times you've broken bread. I don't care if you've, you've received Jesus as your Lord and said, I do care about that. <laughs> but I want you to live knowing that he's king. Because it changes everything. It changes your belief that it can heal. It changes your belief that it can supply. Otherwise, we leave him on a cross. And he's our risen Lord. He's ascended and seated at the right hand of our God. And we need to live within that. This is what C.S. Lewis wrote. I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life. Though I never knew it till now. Come further up. Come further in. For a moment, Peter and James and John got to go further up in Ireland to the land where they belonged, seeing Jesus as he is. I don't get when we don't burn with passion for Jesus because without him, I'm lost for eternity. With him, I have eternity. Number three, know how to follow. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified, but Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. We need to see Jesus in all his glory. We need to hear the voice of God in all that splendor, and yet we're allowed to stand in his presence. We're allowed to stand in the presence of our king and not to be afraid. I am fearful of him, but I'm not afraid. I love that once again, just like last time, it's God the Father that brings revelation to Peter. And he says to Peter, listen to him. You know, you listen to your king. You obey your king. When Jesus says, go into all the world, make disciples, teach them to obey everything I have commanded to you. You know, that's the voice of a king. And our response needs to be one of followers of that king. He lets us see the sun in power. You know, when people argue and one says, you're not hearing me. Have you ever done that thing? You ever been in an argument and somebody shouts, you're not, you're not hearing me. You're not hearing me. I'm saying this, but you're not hearing me. We need to be the people that hear Jesus. We don't just hear the sounds, but we listen, we respond. It changes to listen and to hear. The Greek word, when it says there, listen to him. The Greek word, akuo, means to listen, hearing, changing, transforming. Because you've heard the word of Jesus... The word there means your listening will transform you. Yes. So Jesus' transformation, seeing him as he really is, transforms us. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Because at the end of the day, it's not about Moses or Elijah or anything else. It's about Jesus. Yes. The author and perfecter of our faith. We value the Moses law in its shape. We value the Elijah prophetic and its experience. But without Jesus, they become rules or they become emotions. See, if you just have Moses, you just have rules that trip you up. If you just have the prophetic, if you just have the future, you just have the emotions that can deceive you. They need to be brought together perfectly in Christ. That's where unity is. That's where the glory of the Lord is. When our focus is Jesus, the rules and emotions come together in him. As his Holy Spirit is poured into us, they become the fullness of life. I've come that you might have life in all its fullness. So we grasp the prophetic, we grasp the, the law, but we grasp it in the presence of Jesus. There we can live maturely. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what, what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. I love that. He's let them in on something. Guys, come here. I'm going to show you something. You can't have it all now, but you can see it for a bit. I love you so much. I can't wait till Christmas. I'm going to let you see some of the... You can't have them. I'm just going to let you see the presents and I'm putting them back in the cupboard. But I'm so excited about you owning this, you having this, you being part of this. Guys, look at this. Ta-da! That's it, enough. <laughs> You'll get more later. He literally, that's what he's just done to be. He said, 
look at all of this. And then in a bit, I'm going to die. And you're going to think it's all over. And then I'm coming back. And then, you'll, then you will understand me and my glory. That's what Jesus says to Peter. You can like have a little look. Keep you hanging in there. It's going to be exciting. You think this is good? The best is yet to come. That's what Jesus is doing here. He says, I want to give you a glimpse of the best that's still to come. Because you're going to go through some hard places very soon. You're going to think you've lost me. And you're going to need to retain a glimpse of who Jesus is. So that when you return, you come back. You know what I love about Peter is that when he denies Jesus, he comes back. Yeah. That's faith living. Yeah. He comes back because he's had a glimpse of who Jesus really is. And when he was at his most fearful, Jesus touched him and said, don't be afraid, stand up. Yeah. Peter was prepared. You know, Jesus knew he needed to prepare him so that even in his failure, he knew that he would return. That's how good our God is. Yeah. That's our king. That's his compassion. In Luke chapter 2, there were some shepherds on a hillside living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news. That will cause great joy for all the people. Christmas is coming, can you tell? Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. Is this... Is, he is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. The shepherds got to see the glory of God. And they were fearful. But they were told not to be afraid. Church, we need to see the glory of God. Don't be afraid of seeing the glory of God. The shepherds, ordinary people, are not afraid of seeing the glory of God. Peter, James, and John did not need to be afraid of seeing the glory of God. They needed the glory of God to touch them, to change them, so they could be like him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, it is only because he becomes like us that we can become like him. Amen. So Jesus says, hey, look, take a look at this. Take a look at who I really am, because this is who you're going to become. Yeah. How amazing is that? In your situation today, in your situation today, you can see the glory of God. He can take you to that dark place and make a feast for you in that valley, on that battlefield, in front of your enemies. Jesus, that's our king. Do you know him as king? What makes us authentic disciples are not visions, emotions, Biblical brilliance, physical effort, health or success in our ministry, but a heart for returning faithfulness. Blown by storms and winds of fear and failure, overwhelmed by the events of life. Authentic disciples may stumble and fall, may have sinful lapses and relapses, and may wander away from God. But their allegiance is to Jesus the King, and they keep coming back to him. Band, could you turn to stage? Church, I want to encourage you this morning at home or in person. I want to ask you the question, is Jesus your king? Because Jesus, your king, changes your Monday morning. If he's your king, if your allegiance is to him as your Lord and Savior and king, it changes everything. It enables you to press through that dark place, that valley. It enables you to see him in all his glory. It enables you to begin to become like him. So we're going to sing a final song. As we sing this final song, I, I just want to read these last words over you from C.S. Lewis. I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life. Though I never knew it till now. Come further up. Come further in. See the glory of Christ. See the glory of the risen King. Father, I pray this morning that every one of us here in this room would see the glory of the risen King, would see Jesus for who he is. Lord, we love that you bring your salvation to us. But we pray that we would see you as our Lord and King. More than just the Saviour, but the Saviour the king who surrendered everything to live as a servant, to die on a cross, but who God the Father raised up to glory and seated at 
your side. Lord, help us to live that when we bring our worship in a moment. Help us to live that on Monday morning in our work situation. Help us to live that when we're faced by the dilemmas. Help us to live that when we're faced by the challenges of family life. Help us to live that with our fear of finance. Help us to live that no matter what happens in our lives, that Jesus is King and we see your glory so that we can become like you. Help us to be like you, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I hope in some way that touches or catches your heart that this is our home with Jesus our King. This is where we belong, where we grow together, where we stir and encourage each other. So let's stand, let's worship, and let's pay homage, give our praise to the King of Kings. <laughs>